Thank you very much, Bill. Um, so, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, the session this evening on the Open Source Special Group. Uh, as, you, as you heard, um, the topic of the talk is going to be about contactless biometrics, um, with a big focus on face, actually, but also, as you'll see through the presentation, we'll mention other biometrics too, um, and also related technologies, but the, the focus is really on, about border checks on the go, border checks on the move. Um, and this is a, you know, obviously we think about face here in particular, and obviously contactless, face is obviously contactless in the context here uh, I'll be describing around border security, um, because the idea, let me just instill the idea in your minds already. So think in the future that you will be able to walk off a plane um, with your mobile phone, with your smartphone, and you'll be able to walk across the border nonstop. And your identity um, will be checked on the go. So your facial uh, match will be performed in terms of a biometric match and also other biometrics. But you'll be able to cross the border on the go without stopping. So we'll come to that later in the presentation, that's the vision. Um, let's see how we get there. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey this evening in the next half an hour or so. So the overview is just to give you a bit of introduction to border crossing, I'm sure we've all crossed borders, um, but in particular around what we call the automated border control. So this is really um, talking about e-gates and for those who use e-gates or have used e-gates, you'll already be familiar with the concept of presenting your passport, for example, and then doing a facial match. Uh, in the e-gate uh, in order to, uh, to match against the face on the passport, the live face versus the match, uh, the face on the passport. Um, and you'll be, you'll be familiar with that process, but I'll, I'll go over some details of that. In particular, then I'll be talking about FastPass, and this is a, an, in a way sort of a next generation e-gate um, that really um, will take away the process of removing the process of actually presenting the physical document at the gate. Um, and obviously, with, in COVID times, this is obviously a concern because the more contact there is with documents uh, and surfaces, then obviously, you know, for obvious reasons, that's um, something that people are interested in avoiding. Um, so we can see how we can eliminate the presentation of the document. So really, we just rely on the biometrics itself uh, in the contact this way. So we see how that's that's been performed. Um, that was a project called FastPass, and then we will move on to a project which I led and has just finished a European project called Protect. And this goes again, uh, in a way, a next generation still, um, where we completely uh, remove um, the concept of a, of a physical document. We have a passport on the phone, for example. Uh, we go through an enrollment process, but when you cross the border, it really is contactless all the way and non-stop all the way, whether be it for face or for other biometrics. And then finally, I'll just give you a summary of where we are with those things um, and really a sort of a, a hint towards the future directions of the research. So let me just give a very quick summary first around the context, the background. Well, I'm sure many of you are familiar with biometrics already, um, you know, the face biometric, of course, and I'm sure that many of you have uh, mobile phones, smartphones that incorporate, you know, for example, Face ID or other similar technologies for unlocking the devices for access control. Um, so in that context, though, um, there is an expectation that biometrics will play a, a bigger part and, and that its related technologies in crossing of borders. So again, just to, just to emphasize that today, um, there are limited biometrics in use in, in border crossings. It's primarily face because that's what's on your passport. Um, in some jurisdictions, you also have, for example, fingerprints as well on passports, but essentially the focus still remains very much on face. But in the future, we can expect that new biometrics, emerging biometrics and greater use of face itself, not just visible face or infrared face, but other forms of face like 3D face and so on, will become more, uh, uh, will become, uh, more useful and will be deployed further in, in border control. So this is important to mention already. At the same time, when we think about this, um, in, particularly in terms of border security and, and, the, and the border officers, the border force in the UK, for example, they want to ensure the effectiveness of the process, of course, maintain security, um, and of course, immigration control. You, know, you present yourself at the border uh, claiming to be a, a person, a certain uh, have a certain identity, they have to confirm that identity, but do it in, in a way that's secure, is effective, uh, and, and retains the integrity of the control. Um, we're very interested in speeding up the transaction time. So what I'll be talking about really in this presentation is very much focused on how we can speed up the process of crossing the borders. And that's obviously a benefit to all of us. 
Um, you know, we really don't, we don't want to be in queues. Uh, we want to get across the border quickly. And um, there are other aspects as well, for example, reducing the amount of space required to process passengers. E-gates take up a lot of footprint um, in airports and other ports uh, of entry. Um, they have to be maintained. Um, can we remove some of that uh, equipment, let's say, and can we, can we use spaces more effectively for um, actually um, verifying identities? And finally, I mentioned a bit later about advanced data capture and risk analysis. So you could argue that what I'm going to be talking about is actually a part of a much larger process around border management and thinking about how you perform a risk analysis on travellers, um, either prior to entry or at the time of crossing the border. So I'm going to take a look on a little bit of a journey. So we've all, I'm sure, many of us have been to cross borders in our times, um, perhaps not so much recently because of COVID, but I'm sure many of us have been to a manual check uh, with a border officer who checks our documents and proves our eligibility to cross the border. Many of us, again, would have been through electronic gates, e-gates. Um, so this is a step up, of course, there's an automation here. Um, it's a fairly harmonized, well, not, a, not so much harmonized process, you'll see that in a moment, but a, a fairly consistent and automated process of doing the checks on documents and your biometric face verification. Um, and, you know, in, in many ways, it's quite efficient, but we'll see where the deficiencies are in a moment. Moving on to the fact that we can actually maybe do away with e-gates and have an on-the-move um, process where we effectively move across the border non-stop. So we don't have the physical e-gate infrastructure. We, we literally walk off the plane, the ferry, the, the train and so on and just walk across the border non-stop. And finally, as I say, there's a link into the wider border management and risk analysis as well. So we, we have a progression through these different uh, parts of the journey. So just a very quick mention about e-gates. Um, Border Force in the UK have been operating e-gates since 2008. Um, there's been around three generations of those gates. They process over 125 million passengers. Um, uh, there's 242 of those gates. I think it's just gone up again, actually, uh, in 32 locations in the UK. So you can see it's very pervasive in the, in the UK uh, compared to many other countries. And of course, the border strategy essentially is that all low risk travelers use e-gates. Um, so that's the whole point. Nine, you know, 99.9% .9 of travelers pose very little risk to our borders. Um, and therefore, um, there is obviously a, a process here to um, more effectively um, and um, uh, you know, enable facilitation of crossing of those borders through the use of technology, in this case, the e-gates. You can actually see it's been quite a big increase um, year on year uh, in recent times. That's at Terminal T5. And, and actually, these e-gates do offer many of course, over the manual checks. Um, you can do increased security. So there's routine forgery detection and imposter detection in, in processes in place within the e-gate technologies. Um, improved efficiency, because actually, in the UK at least, um, you have one board officer um, overseeing 10 e-gates. So you can see um, they still need an officer um, to be around, but they can monitor a, a set of gates. Um, they're relatively quick and easy to use, depending on your, on your own experience. And generally, they have very good passenger feedback. Once you know how to use an e-gate, then they're fairly easy and quick to use, I would say. Um, but they have some deficiencies, which I'll say I'll highlight in a moment. Um, so that's really the e-gates. And actually, when they were introduced, um, some of you might remember, um, actually, there was a lot of opposition to them in a sense, or people didn't know how to use them. I think the analogy is like it was when ATMs were introduced, people didn't know the, um, the, the process, um, you know, the, the, uh, the user interface of how to um, uh, interact with uh, ATMs. But now, of course, everyone today more or less does. Um, and it's the same with e-gates. As the technology has been rolled out, people have become more accustomed um, to how to actually use them. So the usability uh, has gone up. And let's just give you a very quick idea of the number of gates. This is quite an old statistic now. It's actually quite hard to get accurate and uh, up-to-date statistics. But, but nonetheless, um, you can see that e-gates are not just within the UK. They're distributed around Europe in this, in this case. Um, and actually, um, Frontex mentioned here are the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. So they oversee the borders. Um, and as you, as you can see, they also oversee the deployment of e-gates throughout, um, throughout the member states. Um, so not just in the UK, they're widely used in some countries much more so than others. So what is the issue with, uh, with these automated border control gates? 
So there's lots of different vendors of those eGates. They all have the same process, which we'll see in a moment, to do with face recognition generally. Um, the majority of those gates are at airports, so you don't really see them in any other ports, um, for example, at seaports or at land borders where you have vehicles. They're mostly the face biometric only. Um, and that is a limitation, actually, which we'll see in a moment. And a part of that is that um, it limits the spoofing um, detection capability because you have one biometric and maybe it's a question for later but um, the question is the vulnerability of that system to spoofing and I'm sure that many of you have heard about uh, face morphing where you can take two face images and morph them and potentially use that as a, a way to defeat um, a facial recognition system um, and that's that's also, also a concern for e-gates actually um, and then video surveillance so there are video surveillance of the area but actually not necessarily um, analytic capability, which tells, for example, whether someone's trying to defeat the system, um, you know, um, um, uh, trying to spoof their identity and so on. Um, can that be detected and detected in another way? But there, so there is a need for a harmonized gate because there are these different vendors. So you want to talk about sort of an open, interoperable architecture that incorporates the biometrics like face. But the, the notion in here is having an arm harmonized gate they can actually be used across lots of different border types uh, at airports, at seaports, and at land borders. And you'll see why that makes relevance in a minute. And when you're wondering how does it work for an airport and also a land border, you'll, we'll come to that. Um, and then to again to implement more advanced technology modules, because as I say, we're in terms of spoofing, we're always trying to be one step ahead of the spoofer, let's say. And um, you know, uh, once someone knows how to defeat the system, perhaps um, through uh, uh, face spoofing, um, you know, and I'm sure, you know, one, one example is using, for example, 3D masks, and there have been some examples of that in the news. Um, how can we build better algorithms, uh, software that can detect the spoofing of face, uh, and particularly on the move? So that's one thing just to note now is that there's been a lot of research around spoof detection um, in a static context, where, for example, you present yourself in front of a camera for the face recognition, and you're more or less static in front of that camera at a fixed distance. But consider the case where, what I mentioned earlier, the vision of you walking across the border non-stop, then that adds a very new dimension to uh, not just the verification, the face recognition, but also around how to do the spoofing detection, because capturing your face uh, with sufficient quality on the move to do recognition and spoofing detection is actually quite a challenge. So the first thing we'll talk about, talk about here is, is, is called FastPass. Um, so this is a project that ran uh, and finished in actually in 2017. And the follow-up is Protect, which we'll talk about in a moment. But the idea here is actually to develop this idea of this harmonized module, what's called this modular reference system for, uh, for automated border control. In other words, to build a harmonized e-gate um, following a very user-centric approach. So very much focused on the traveler and of course the border guard, because the border guard is the other sort of set of users, let's say. Um, and it's a project which ran four years and really looked at the challenges around security, spoofing, um, of course the acceptability. So acceptability is very important nowadays. And we mentioned right at the beginning, we all mentioned about face um, very briefly as being in the news. Well, this is a big challenge. You know, um, you know we, can, we, can, we can see the, incre the increased use of face recognition, but how do we really prove the benefits and show um, how uh, you know, it actually enhances our quality of life. Uh, in this case, we're looking at how we can use face to, uh, uh, to actually um, uh, speed up crossing the borders, uh, which is obviously a huge benefit, um, but really make it acceptable so people understand when the face capture is being performed, where the data is being stored, how it's being processed, when is it deleted and so on. So really you've got to have um, uh, there are a lot of challenges around acceptability and trust in, 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 in the whole process, really. Um, so let's say it's a project called FastPass. Um, it operated, I just mentioned on the left here, it had to, actually had 27 European partners. It was around 11, 12 million euro project. Um, so it's a big interdisciplinary mix of people, um, scientists um, looking at individual biometrics, but, but also integrators for building the prototypes that would be used at the borders. And then you have experts, for example, also in the legal and ethics aspects as well, because in security research, the legal and ethical aspects, as I hinted at, are extremely important and really are integral to the whole design, 
um, of the resulting system. So I mentioned here about the different areas. So on the left, we've got um, supporting the different concepts around the border crossing. So looking at the air border, the land border, and the cruise ship uh, from a maritime perspective. So this is very interesting because imagine a cruise ship where you want to process travelers um, departing or disembarking um, a cruise ship. Um, so can you put them through a portal, a way where you can actually identify them more or less on the move, particularly using face? Um, and the same is true, by the way, for embark embarkation and disembarkation. This is a very interesting case where for security, you want to obviously be sure and audit who's on the ship. Um, and again, face could be used in that environment too for doing um, the facial recognition check um, and actually verifying in a one-to-one -one context because most people on, on, on ships have uh, a cruise ship card. Um, you can link that to your identity, of course, and then use that for the one-to-one -one verification. But um, FastPass looked at these, um, the idea of this reference architecture with open interfaces, very much a, a focus on the open uh, aspects here. So I don't want you to always think, or maybe you don't think, but they think that, that research is always closed in the sense that um, when industry is involved, um, you know, everything has to be proprietary. It's really not the case. Um, in these kinds of European projects, there's actually a very big focus on developing open resources, open source data, um, which is produced actually in this project, open architectures, uh, etc. Um, and this is very important um, because, you know, um, on one side, it's kind of the academic element where we want to further the research and um, bring awareness and also um, enable others to contribute uh, and, and refine and improve the system and processes. Um, um, and that's, as I say, that's important. So we have to make certain things open. And that's, that's, you know, that's, that's really also increasing towards um, contributing towards standardization. There's also security evaluation as well. Um, advanced technology modules, as I mentioned earlier, around identification surveillance, for example. I won't go into too much of these details, but integrating um, with what we call third country nationals, um, and this is about evaluating the value of what we call this registered, registered traveler program. Um, and what, we'll see how that's, this is done in a moment. Um, and using various um, uh, concepts around scanning of documents and kiosks, uh, the go through concept, the instantaneous go through and harmonization. And of course, also liaising with lots of different agencies that have an interest, stakeholders that have an interest in, in this area. So I just want to emphasize the concept here around using the face. So on the left hand side, you have what we call actually, in terms of terminology, we have what's called the basic man trap. So this is a, an e-gate that you might typically see, for example, at Heathrow today, uh, it's a good example, where you arrive at the e-gate and you present your document um, at the scanner, uh, at the gate, um, and, 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 and soon afterwards, or even simultaneously, your face, your live face is captured, um, and then that's compared against the face on the chip. And it, it follows, a, the, the face on the chip follows a standard, there's an IKO standard, um, and the match is performed. And then, you know, if, if the match is a, if a sufficient match, then uh, you'll be allowed to proceed. You've been, you've been, you've been identified. Now, as I said earlier, though, that's not the ideal situation because you've got to physically present the document. Um, and this is not great, particularly in COVID times, to be handling documents and presenting them on surfaces that others are using. So already FastPass, although I didn't know it at the time, had already considered this to some extent and moved to what we call a segregated two-step system. So in very simple terms, you can think of this as having a, a two-step process where you first enroll and enrollment here means enrolling, for example, at a kiosk. So you would actually go to a kiosk and that kiosk would be in a, an area that's monitored, for example, at an airport or you know, it's a supervised process where you, again, just, just once present your travel documents, your passport or your identity card, and then you have your face captured and then your face becomes a token for future border crossings. So there's a link established to your face uh, that's been captured and basically is stored and basically when you then afterwards cross the border in future you won't need to present the document at the e-gate you simply more or less pass through the e-gate non-stop and your face is uh, captured on the move and verified on the move so this concept was actually demonstrated um, at uh, vienna airport as i say the face is your token in this case, 
Um, and the idea, of course, is to increase the throughput. You know, you, you're doing this more or less in a non-stop process. You might have to briefly stop, but certainly not as long as you would have to do in terms of um, the passport reading. And I, I should I should emphasize, by the way, in, in a traditional e-gate, in, in the baseline man track, the longest part of the e-gate process is actually reading the chip, reading the face from the chip. So that's the longest part of the process. So by eliminating that part of the process, you can actually speed up the whole e-gate process. So just to bring a little bit of emphasis again to the face here, so as part of the project, and we had a lot of innovations around um, different biometric technologies, and I want to focus just here, obviously in this talk a bit more about face. So we had companies involved who could deliver uh, specific technologies and to uh, innovate around face. And this is just one example here where we had a company called Modi, and they were actually developing what's called uh, a Modomo mirror and actually very fast mirror technology. And the idea is that actually, um, in, in the very simple terms, you, you have, a, a for example, a dual camera system. And one camera is used to localize the face. So as you're approaching the E-gate, uh, one camera basically localizes your face in the captured image. And then you have a, a second um, camera, which actually captures the face at a higher resolution. So it's a, it's a, it's a sort of combined approach. Um, it, it operates under infrared or can be also in other wavelengths. Um, it has counter spoofing built in, um, but it's really to allow rapid acquisition and uh, capture at a distance of your face um, on the move. And the reason you're probably wondering why do you need such, such a sensor? Well, if you imagine the typical case of someone passing through this kind of e-gate, someone of different heights, for example, um, and so on, then, well, you could, you could argue you could do this with lots of different cameras, or you could do it with fewer cameras and have some clever way of moving the cameras or using dual cameras to actually do the face capture. And that's really the focus on this technology. So this is actually something that was new uh, and was actually um, very interesting. Just a very quick mention about the cruise ship concept. Well, this is very similar. I won't go into too much details, but again, the face biometric was used here. Uh, you see on the bottom left of the slide an e-gate. And the real difference here was that this was not a static e-gate actually, it was an e-gate that could be movable and can actually move around the different environments. The user, the, the, uh, the, the practitioner here at the, in terms of the port facility wanted a, an e-gate that could be moved around the different parts of the environment and used um, a different entry points into the port. Um, so this was something that was quite innovative as well in terms of having a movable gate. But apart from that, the technology was very similar. Now in, in Morabita, um, in Romania, this is an interesting case. So this was a, the case of the land border concept where now instead of people on foot, we have vehicles. Um, and this, is, this required a different setup where vehicles would actually progress, uh, would move towards the border. They would have to temporarily stop. And rather than having an e-gate per se, you had a move, we had a terminal essentially where um, basically the checks were made, including the check and you can see in the top right the case where um, actually the traveler or you as the driver would remain within the vehicle and then your face biometric would be captured through the window and verified against your document that also you would put through the window um, so the whole process is kind of similar to an e-gate but obviously in, in a vehicle setup um, the process also incorporated some aspects around document checks as well particularly vehicle document checks um, but overall it was still Let's say the overall process was very similar um, and very importantly the architecture including the biometrics was the same so the same harmonized architecture that was used for the air border and the sea border also used here but just deployed in a different in a different way there were pilots and demonstrations of this technology uh, i mentioned around vienna um, or the air border um, and also this is the cruise terminal case as well and uh, where face was used um, uh, and actually in Vienna, sorry, the face for both the air border and the, and the sea border. And Vienna, we used the face and actually part of the trial also used fingers as well. Uh, and the reason for that is because for third country nationals where there's, there are visa requirements, there's a, there's actually, there was actually a need to capture fingerprints as well as face. Um, but as you can see, predominantly it's face is the biometric that's used. So let me just play you a video. Uh, well, I just saw that. Uh, 
just outline, outline very quickly the main achievements here. The next generation sensors, as you, as you saw an idea about software, the framework for doing the on the move identifications, the framework there, the scenarios for the different air border, cruise ship, land border scenarios, people remaining in vehicles at the land borders. There was methodology for holistic risk and security assessment and recommendations for the future ABC for automated border control. So a lot of the work was really towards future exploitation of this kind of technology at borders at throughout Europe in particular. And um, there was lots of other biometric innovations too. And if you have questions about this, please ask me later. But I just I don't want you to sort of think it was just face. Um, we, we looked at using face and fingerprint and how to fuse that in a way that uh, incorporated spoofing attack detection. So we wrote up papers on this. We looked at sclera segmentation. You might be wondering what sclera is. This is the white region of the eye that can be used to help localize the iris if you want to do iris recognition um, and so on. And we also looked at combining 3D and 2D information for periocular recognition. The periocular, if you've not heard about, is an emerging biometric, which essentially is the eye and the region around the eye. So if you look at the bottom of bottom left of the slide, you can see actually a 3D image or a set of 3D images of actually your eye and the region around. So it's the combination of 3D information from a 3D sensor combined with a 2D image of the periocular region uh, that's combined to do recognition. And we found through the research that this proved to be very uh, variable biometric in itself. So we're looking here at combining the use of different biometrics um, going forward. OK, so um, finally, there was also work done on surveillance as well, looking at um, making sure that people, for example, weren't tailgating in inside the e-gate. So you can see on the left hand side there, making sure that people are separated. So, that, so for example, two people weren't trying to get through the e-gate at the same time. Um, on the right hand side, you can use, you see the use of video surveillance for looking at people queuing. Um, so you can use that to help with waiting times and, and, and queue management. And then on the bottom right, you can see, for example, left luggage. So are people leaving items or uh, around the vicinity of the gate? And then the bottom left, you can see example of abnormal behavior detection. So are people acting uh, abnormally in this environment? So it's, are people trying to evade the control, for example? So you can see the advantages perhaps of where video surveillance can be combined with, say, face biometric um, for more holistic and, and comprehensive um, uh, monitoring process and identification process. So let me quickly move on to a video just so you can um, see the highlights of uh, FastPass. <laughs> The number of people crossing the EU borders is constantly increasing. This poses a major challenge for border control. Travellers demand a simple and speedy border crossing experience, while border guards have to fulfil their obligation to secure the EU's borders. The FastPass project serves both needs by maintaining security at the highest level while increasing the speed and comfort of the border crossing for travellers. The project is funded by the European Commission under its seventh framework programme and brings together 27 different partners from across the EU. Its aim is to design and demonstrate a new approach to automated border control that is harmonised and can be deployed in air, sea and land border scenarios. FastPass has innovated in a number of technology areas such as biometrics, video surveillance and passport scanning. The result is the next generation e-gate. This brings benefits to both border guards and travelers. For travelers, it means a fast and convenient border crossing. On the other hand, it allows border guards to spend more time on focusing on potential risks. FastPass has been successfully trialed in three different border scenarios. The air border demonstration took place at Vienna Airport. The passenger must first register at an automated kiosk. The traveller's passport is presented to the system and a biometric face scan is taken. At the e-gate, the biometric is matched and the passenger is able to cross the border quickly. A key innovation in FastPass is that it removes the time-consuming document check from the e-gate. Having a paperless border control system helps reduce waiting times. 
FastPass technology has been adapted for ferries and cruise ships at sea borders. The procedure is identical. However, the e-gates have been modified to be portable. They were successfully trialled at the port of Piraeus in Greece. The final trial has been running at Morovica, a land border between Romania and Serbia. Here the technology has undergone a more substantial adaptation. After registration of a kiosk, vehicles are directed to an automated checkpoint where passengers interact with robotic terminals that automatically locate the windows. FastPass has translated cutting-edge innovative technology into a real-life, commercially-ready system that is harmonized across different countries and is easily adapted for use across air, sea and land borders. It's a unique system that effectively answers the increased demand for fast, efficient and secure automated border controls. Okay, so I hope that gives you a good overview. Um, let me quickly move on and just talk about the tech now. So, what are the issues with e-gates in general? Well, you can still have the queues. Um, one, well, also you, can, you have this issue with the permissible user group. So uh, family groups, um, children under 12 years old, for example, in the UK can't use the e-gates. Um, the transaction times, um, despite the fact that um, you can improve it with FastPass, it's still not an entirely non-stop process. Um, there's limited space um, because you still have the e-gates in place. So, so although, FastPass evolved the e-gate, it, it's still an e-gate, it still takes up physical space. And there's a cost of installing and maintaining this technology um, and the usability aspects and dealing with increasing passenger numbers. So the question is, can they really handle future increased travel numbers? So the question is, how can we improve upon that? So we don't want the, we don't want the queues, whether it's in airports, airports, seaports or land borders. I would say we don't really want even the e-gates. So the vision is to use new biometric technologies that can enable free-flowing border control systems without the need for these physical border lines, without the need for those e-gates. So the vision is a contactless, free-flowing border control system using advanced but appropriate technology. So contactless biometric recognition on the move, um, which is obviously including face. And as we'll see, it can be not just visible face, it could be infrared face in two dimensions, so 2D face, but also it could be 3D face, um, it could be thermal face, for example. So this is the multimodal biometrics. So there's fusion, so there's face, but it could also be combined with iris, maybe fingerprints um, or other biometrics, but we're looking at ones which really can be used on the move. We want to, of course, address counter spoofing. And to, to better exploit other technologies, for example, the traveler's own mobile devices within the process and futurally to look at future electronic machine readable documents in other words we're all familiar with using our e-passport but what's the next generation e-passport going to look like so if they stay around what can we expect from a future electronic passports so i can see this i can uh, can see this project called protect similar in to fast pass in the sense of the european project we had 10 partners um, I won't go through all of them now, but you can see it's a whole interdis interdisciplinary mix as well. And then we had two end users. One was the UK Home Office and the second one was the Polish Border Guard. And it ran for three years and had five million euros of funding. So one of the key concepts um, in the whole project was the idea of having essentially what you can call a biometric corridor. Uh, it's a sensor configuration spanning a corridor that performs the personal identification um, of travelers on the move. So you don't have the e-gate, but you simply have an instrumented um, uh, environment, a, a corridor in this sense. So it's lightly supervised. It uses multimodal biometrics, including face. It's contactless. Um, we, it enables a non-intrusive and a non-stop robust and rapid passing through. And also we can incorporate surveillance or CCTV-based monitoring, let's say, to limit um, the number of biometric templates to match against, it actually helps with the biometric matching. Um, and also we can use it for anomaly detection, for example, if someone's trying to evade the control. The other aspect mentioned is mobile devices. So utilizing the traveler's own mobile phones. And this is a key part of the process. So again, it's the whole concept of going through a, an enrollment process. So Protect did something similar to FastPass, where we had an enrollment process actually with a kiosk. Um, and then we had the passing of the border using a biometric corridor. 
But at the kiosk point of at the kiosk, in terms of the enrollment, you still presented your travel document once. Um, but this time you had a wider range of biometrics collected at that at that time. And those biometrics that would be collected, including face, like 3D face and thermal face, would then be stored securely on your smartphone. So your smartphone essentially becomes your passport. Okay, so it becomes your travel credentials. Um, that's a that's a really key um, innovation. And then thirdly, um, we also looked at how to extend electronic passports. Although I would say the vision was really to use your smartphone uh, as a way of crossing the border, we also looked equally though at how we could extend e-passports and actually more precisely what we call advanced passports to either store well, and primarily to store more biometrics than just face or, for example, face and fingerprints that is used today. But the question is, could you store these biometrics on a passport in a way that the document could be used in a non-stop approach? So you still pass the border without stopping. OK, so there has to be transmission in either case between the mobile phone and the border control system or the document and the border control system in a way that's contactless and over the air while you're crossing the border. So there's biometric fusion as part of this process because we're now starting to think about integrating a wider range of biometrics. And in, and in particular, in Protect, we looked at, for example, iris, we looked at face and different modalities of face, as I mentioned. We use anthropometrics, which is a link to gait analysis, the way you walk. Um, they were the primary ones. Um, yes, I don't think that's all that. Periocular, as I mentioned before. So we use a range, we, we evaluated a range of biometrics to see how effective they could be for this purpose, for this task. <clears throat> but ultimately, um, you have to fuse these biometrics um, to, to eventually reach a decision on the identification. And this is a challenge because and it includes the face acquisition, because you imagine now that the task is that you, you arrive at the border, you pass through a biometric corridor, your biometrics are captured on the move, and basically the biometrics have to be fused and a decision has to be made on the recognition, i.e. are you identified, by the time you reach the end of the corridor. So it has to be integrated and operating in real time, more or less. So there's a, there's a real um, emphasis here on the integration and the uh, operation and, and the effectiveness of the processes to enable a very rapid decision to be made at the, by the time you reach the end of the corridor. As part of this work, we did a lot of data collection um, we built mock corridors, um, we detected, for example, 3D face here, 2D face. And by the way, we also disseminated to the wider community a very novel multimodal biometric data set, including face. So um, as part of towards, sort of towards standardization and enable, enabling researchers, um, both in commercial environments and academically, to evaluate multimodal fusion and recognition using a range of biometrics that could be uh, operated on the move, this is something that we did as part of the research to, to benefit the wider community. And here's an example where we produced a customized phone to capture a uh, face in 2D uh, uh, and infrared on the mobile handset using a customized infrared illuminator uh, to actually uh, illuminate the environment correctly. So let me just show you the video then that was generated um, to show the outcomes of this work. By 2030, the amount of air travelers is expected to almost double. Speed and accuracy in traveler identification must increase to keep up with the needs of travelers, border agencies, carriers, and ports of entry. Protect is a no-gate crossing solution to automated border control, which allows biometric verification to be performed on the move in air, sea, and land borders. Funded by the European Commission under the H2020 Research and Innovation Programme, PROTECT brings together 10 different partners from across the EU. The aim of the project is to increase the speed and comfort of border crossings, eliminating queues whilst maintaining the security and integrity of the control. PROTECT has innovated in a number of ways, including biometrics, mobile passports and privacy enhancing technologies. The result is a no-gate crossing solution, which brings huge benefits to both border guards and travellers. It means a fast and convenient border crossing. Moreover, 
the project has fully taken into account the legal, ethical and societal considerations. To use the Protect system, travellers can enrol at an automated kiosk anywhere and at any time using a dedicated app on their smartphone. They first present their passport and a match is established to the live face biometric. Then additional biometrics are captured, including finger vein and thermal face, which are securely stored on their smartphone. Once enrolled, this acts as a paperless travel document, letting travellers cross all EU borders quickly without re-registering or stopping for a manual passport check. On top of this, Protect has researched the use of advanced passports with secure UHF technology, which can also be used on the move. A successful demonstration of this technology took place with travellers on foot at the St Pancras International Railway Station in the United Kingdom. To cross the border, enrolled travellers open the Protect app and then walk through a corridor, which is also designed to accommodate less able travellers. As they walk through, their face, periocular and anthropometry biometrics are captured and verified on the move. And if someone isn't identified or tries to spoof the system, the border guard is immediately notified on a tablet and can intercept the traveller. Innovative mixed reality technologies like Microsoft HoloLens could also be an option for the future. Well, it's already looking at extensively at future borders, particularly in the areas of biometric technology. This allows us to maintain the integrity of the border, deal with increasing passenger numbers and the challenges of the infrastructure we have at ports around the country. A second demonstration of the Protect system took place in Poland, with travellers driving across the border. With, without leaving the vehicle, the traveller opens their app and drives up to the checkpoint. The Protect system automatically adjusts for the correct height of their window and guides them through the process. Under the supervision of the border guard, each passenger verifies their face biometric using the Protect app on their smartphone. Then, finger veins and thermal face are captured and verified. If the biometric checks are accepted, the driver is notified that they can proceed and cross the border. The Protect system has many benefits for border guards because it is a no-gate crossing solution. It provides us a high-level biometric checks that helps us to deal with increasing vehicle flops. All of this means that border guard experts can focus more on high-risk passengers, whereas low-risk passengers can go through the border control process smoothly and quickly. As a key project partner and industry leader in identity solutions, I can see that Protect has given us the opportunity to go beyond the limitations of current automated border control solutions, leading to new worldwide business opportunities. The Protect system is a groundbreaking innovation that can be used on the move whilst maintaining privacy and security for an easier and more effective border crossing in the future. Okay, I hope that's given a really good overview. Um, actually, my time's almost up, so I just want to very quickly mention just a couple of things. Um, you might be interested to know that um, currently, according to what we call the Schengen Borders Code, um, we can't yet deploy this kind of technology within Europe. So the fact that we have these mobile passports um, and multiple biometrics um, is actually outside or beyond uh, the current law. Um, so outside the EU, it's not in, in some jurisdictions, it's not such an issue. But within Europe, it would have to be changed to the uh, borders code to actually allow this technology to be deployed. But actually, this was the motive of the European Commission to see really what was the potential of the technology and then how that could inform the policy makers. Um, so we finished the journey. Um, I just want to say one well, of the journey that this would really fit into a wider risk assessment and you might have heard more about how travellers and use of advanced passenger information and so on can be used. So this is really focusing, what we've seen today is really been focusing on the identification at the border, but you can see how this process could fit into a wider border management um, uh, process. So we've seen fast pass, we've seen how Protect uh, can go beyond fast pass in terms of the harmonized approach 
and extend it really into a fully on the move process. And then beyond Protect, um, we can think about how we can integrate Protect into a wider risk assessment process and really looking more at identity more holistically, uh, including other aspects as well. So thank you very much. I hope that's been interesting.